Hi, everybody. And I know that it's been a little over a week since we last, uh, well, had any interaction from me, I guess is the best way to put that. Um, I'm sorry it's been a little while, but I got to be honest with you. I'm really grappling with what the heck is going on in our um, political system. Um, as you all know, living in a democratic republic can take on various different sort of, um, well, honestly, you can kind of see different forms of it, right? Throughout history, depending on context, depending on um, particularly whether the power is distributed or whether it's centralized, we know that our governments, our social organizations are, are dictated by, by that power structure but even across democracies, they can look a little bit different from each other. And, um, you know, the parliamentary uh, democracy is a little bit different from ours. And ours supposedly functions on an idea of free speech um, and sort of the assumption of an educated public a little bit. Uh, our founding fathers, whether we like to believe it or not, really did not want just anybody voting, or I should say everybody. There was never an intent for there to be a direct democracy, um, indirect uh, with representatives maybe, but that was about it. They really did not foresee what was coming. And so that has brought up questions over the past several decades about whether or not an uninformed, less informed, lesser informed public should be allowed to choose its own leaders. And of course, we've always believed that that's the case. That's what we should do. Just because in the 17 and 1800s, we put our faith in other people to do that for us does not mean that by 1921, we weren't you know, uh, allowing everybody to vote, allowing being the term there, because of course, as we all know, there are ways to suppress a vote. Um, and that's not a new concept, by the way, that's been around for a long while. So there are ways of doing it. And also the things that dictated whether or not people participated in the political process has significantly changed. Um, there was a book out about 20 years ago um, that I can still, I've, I've pretty much got kind of memorized at this point, but that talks about the seven different types of non-voters and those seven different types of non-voters have even changed over the years. I, I'm not even sure that it's helpful to um, keep categorizing people the same way. It, it doesn't do any good because the context of our political system has changed so much that the models from political science have been thrown out the window. Um, 538's even struggling, uh, Nate Silver, with, with how to go about doing the predictions. Um, we were so surprised by 2016, and it doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on on that, by the way. What matters is, is that in 2016, our political system, um, as it played out in the voting system, was uh, a complete surprise. People thought they could predict who would vote, who would, they would vote for, how many people would vote, where they would vote. Um, so that they knew the outcome, which of course was supposed to be in supposed to be Hillary Clinton, um, but of course it wasn't. And so no one can say Donald Trump was elected um, illegitimately. It was completely within the realm of our political system, our voting system. But the predictions were so far off that most of us are, are a little bit skittish of making any predictions now. And so you'll see politicos sort of saying nothing about who's gonna win, I mean, they'll talk about trends and they'll say this is current and that trend seems to be holding, but not, it's going to hold out. One of the reasons for that is that political science is notoriously 2020, right? I mean, I, I'm sorry, not 2020. We're, we're really not 2020, we're the opposite of that. Um, we're, we're a hindsight, uh, political science is a hindsight social, social science in research. Political communication by its very nature is also hindsight. Um, that's where the 2020 came from, because in 2020, we can't be 2020. We can't see what's going to happen. We can only look back on it and look at historical trends. So what changed in 2016 um, that was so historic? Well, first of all, we had a female, um, uh, a woman who identified as female running for president. Um, that was new. Uh, second, we had a TV show host who and a, and a businessman who never 
ever identified with philanthropy, social organizations, uh, legislative organizations, government involvement, really of any kind. I mean, aside from pontificating on the media when they would give him the platform to do so, he didn't really have much to do with it. So we had two very um, different people up for president, different not just from each other, but different from the entire history of what we had known up until that point. Um, the second thing that made it historic was because the, the, the Electoral College played such a significant role. And that's not to say that, you know, there haven't been elections based on the, the Electoral College in the past. There have been. But let's consider those for a second. Um, the, the most recent one was Al Gore and George W. Bush in 2000. And the reason, the way that actually played out had very little to do with the Electoral College and a lot more to do with the Supreme Court and the governor of Florida and how votes were counted, okay? So that was less about the Electoral College. Prior to that, um, we had uh, the 2000, or, I'm sorry, I guess it was after that, people argue that 2004, was questionable as well. I disagree. I think that one was pretty much a, a, a done deal. I We knew who was going to win. Uh, we had a really good idea of who was going to win. Um, that was not really a question. Um, and then in 1860, which was one of the, uh, or was the first, excuse me, um, electoral college vote decider, um, that was actually... Um, from what we understand, sort of a fluke in the system, but not everybody was voting at that time. So it's kind of hard to tell how much of a role the electoral college actually played in that one. So really in 2016, that's really the first time we can identify, okay, the president who is president and elected president won, not because they had the greatest number of votes, not in that democratic way, but in the representative de democracy of how many votes are counted in the electoral college for that area of the country and how they voted. Um, it's one of the, the most bizarre things people have a hard time wrapping their brain around. Now I've been saying for literally like, what are we, we're in 2020, I've been saying for 20 years that we should get rid of the electoral college. Um, not because of what happened in 2000, but uh, that probably wouldn't, would have happened no matter what, honestly. Uh, but what was happening with the electoral college all the time this idea that you could win 3 million more votes than your opponent and still lose the election didn't mean, seem to make sense. It doesn't make sense in what people interpret as a direct democracy, um, whether we are one or not. It's been our tradition that we generally elect the person that the most people voted for. That's the sort of lie that we tell ourselves um, as the premise to our elections. You'll notice I I use the word lie. Um, the reason I did that is because we should not downplay the importance of the voting system in order to understand our election outcomes. And that actually becomes very important today when I talk about uh, gender and its impact on politics. And, and I'll show you why. It's going to be a windy uh, segue, but, but we're going to get there because um, the process of voting has changed so much over the past 20, prior to that, the previous 100 years that we are very far removed from the place where voting is described, which is to say um, in not the constitution so much as in the, um, the uh, Federalist Papers, okay? Why? Because Hamilton, and this is true, by the way, I could have told you this long before the, the, the play, by the way, just so you know, the musical. Um, some people didn't know who Hamilton was prior to uh, that musical, but um, I am one of the nerds that did, mainly because, I mean, the dude's on the $10 bill, so he's obviously important. The question was why he started America's Bank. Fantastic. Good reason for him to be on money, I guess. Um, but in addition to that, he also, by creating that federal system of banking, it sort of forced us into uniting. So we've talked about this before, where the states didn't want necessarily to unite. The Democratic Republicans, as they were called back then, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, and others did wanted each of the states to be basically their own country. 
And I said, that's where we get governors from. And Hamilton came along and said, okay, no, listen, what we need is a banking system that's centered in New York City, um, that's, that's separate from the government, but he knew would unify all of the states under that bank. He knew that. He knew that was going to happen. So some might argue that his proposition of the Electoral College um, to get the banking system was one of the most brilliant moves uh, that he could make because it made um, the Southerners feel more comfortable with the election system, the voting process. What happened after that is I would assume that he thought if there's a problem with the Electoral College, you just do away with it, except it is in uh, mentioned in the Constitution. So we're kind of stuck with it unless we did something massive with our Constitution, which is why people mention constitutional crisis on a regular basis. Um, using the, um, you know, the different amendments to get the president out, that's new. Uh, that could put you into a constitutional crisis. Um, wanting to uh, talk about um, the Electoral College being abolished, that would be a constitutional crisis. So, and, and the president, honestly, the president saying um, Article 2 tells me I can do whatever I want, that's kind of a constitutional crisis too, because um, it doesn't say that. Uh, if it does, somebody please correct me, but I, I've read it a few times. But in the Federalist Papers, Hamilton sets up the Electoral College so that he can alleviate the concerns of the Southerners thinking that the well-populated states would over would run over uh, the less populated states in the South. He was probably correct at that time that this was an equalizer, but it's no longer the case uh, for, for a multitude of reasons. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that if a bunch of people live in New York, LA, Chicago, and Dallas, um, and that's where they, they vote and they end up being the deciding factors in an election. Well, that's because the populations are bigger. That makes sense to me, right? So we, we don't really have the reasons we used to have for the Electoral College. So why is that important? Well, in 2016, it was important because it played the game for Donald Trump, okay? Jerry Kushner was very good at figuring out exactly what Donald Trump needed to do in order to win the electoral votes that he needed, not worrying about the popular vote. Okay, that's a strategy. Not one any of us ever thought of before um, because it's risky, right? It's incredibly risky, um, but uh, they pulled it off. Now, when you, when you don't expect the Spanish Inquisition, that's when it's gonna get you, right? So nobody was really paying attention to that. And, and it, was a, it was a really good strategy in the end. It worked really well for them. But what it also did was downplayed a few other things that were going on. People were so confused about how Trump got elected through the Electoral College and whether or not that was a bad or a good thing that we ignored that there was the first woman uh, running for president on a major party ticket. And I'm putting it that way because we've had women in the past, a long, long time ago, several times run for president, but they were on uh, tickets that were so, so small and so uh, not well supported that, you know, I don't even think they made it under the final ballot, that sort of thing. So I want to say in the first major party, first woman to run for president and to be elected by her party, to be the re to be representing that party in the election. Um, the second thing that got ignored was the question of of race in that election. It, it like went away. Why? Because we had two white people running. Is that was that the deal? Um, maybe. But we just came off of an eight year presidency with um, the the first president who happened to to be um, to be black, and so. Why those two things were ignored is probably because they would not have helped Donald Trump, right? So you shift the focus over a little bit. You shift it a little bit. So this week I said I was going to talk to you about gender and politics um, or sex and politics. And, and I am going to do that now by first acknowledging that previously it's been ignored. But we have something very fascinating coming up. And what is it, like 50 days, 49 days, I think. Uh, we're, we're getting closer, let's put it that way, to the election. Okay, so what the heck are we doing with Kamala Harris? 
right? Kamala, Kamala Harris. I'm sorry. I'm totally pronounced, mispronounced it all the time. Uh, so what are we doing with Kamala Harris? She is selected to be the vice president um, in the on the Democratic ticket, okay? And I, I mean, I assume you know that, but, and in case you aren't like adjusting the color on your television or you just stepped out of Pleasantville, she's black. Um, and so we have now a black woman running for a major, like the number two, uh, <laughs> the number two political office in the country. So we went from, you know, okay, I, I was confused. We, okay, so we elected a person who happened to be black for the presidency. We could have elected a person who happened to be a woman. That would have been okay, but it didn't happen. And it seemed like the country made a major, like sort of pendulum shift back to pendu pendulum swing is what I want to say. All the way back to um, we want white men running for president because that's what we ended up with this time. Um, and so when Joe Biden and his team picked uh, Kamala, we were real, I should say Senator Harris. That's really the most respectful thing to say, right? Um, we, we started looking at, at Kamala Harris. Uh, she meets so many different, um, what's the word I want to, I want to look for here, variables that we usually don't deal with. Um, we don't know how to deal with, um, having some sort of diversity in our political system at those levels confuses people. Um, I'm going to give you an example and it's a, a personal example in some ways, but it is it, the numbers play out. Um, there is a county in Pennsylvania uh, called Beaver County. I know it's right next to Allegheny County. Allegheny County is the city of Pittsburgh and the county is around um, Pittsburgh. I, I can't really name. I can name as they go north, um, but I, I kind of get lost on the southern ones. Right. But what they did was for 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 at least the previous 50 years. OK, so like that I knew of because <laughs> my mom and dad would tell me beaver county was you know bright royal blue it was not going anywhere it was everybody bled blue and that meant something completely different in pennsylvania southwest pennsylvania than it meant in massachusetts okay we totally 100 percent uh were were a, a democratic uh area of the country in 2008 that election we turned crimson red like blood red. I say we, I don't live there anymore. The Southwest corner of Pennsylvania, much like the Southwest corner of Missouri. I mean, they're basically in the same positions in the States relatively. And they also both are in the foothills or uh, the sides of major mountain ranges, the Ozarks, the Appalachians. Um, mo and, and they're all sort of like, we're also in industrial, uh, post-industrial um we're both post-industrial cities. Pittsburgh is the second largest city in Pennsylvania. Springfield's the third in Missouri. So the the values of the people are actually quite similar. Um, you had the aluminum, steel, and oil industry uh, down here. Same thing up there. So we've suffered the same economic sort of downturns, and and the people are sort of these blue-collar, hardworking farmers um, or uh, steel workers or oil rig workers, or, um, you know, uh, in the steel industry, there's all sorts of um, parts of that. My grandfather was a carpenter in a steel mill, for example. So those two areas are very similar. Now, Southwest Missouri has always been red. That's, that's not even a question. So what happened in 2008 that turned Beaver County bright royal blue into dark crimson red? And the answer to that question was, we elected Barack Obama. And I, I cannot tell you the amount of overt racism that was coming out of Southwest Pennsylvania. Um, Senator Murtha at the time had said Southwest Pennsylvania is the most racist, bigoted place he had ever been. He, you know, rest his soul. He's dead now. Um, and he was right. Uh, you know, we had people saying things like, um, I can't believe we, uh, and this is a direct quote, so please don't think I would ever advocate to say this, but um Somebody said to me once, I can't believe we, we, we elected that, that little black boy to be president. I'm like, what are you talking about? I mean, this is a respected lawyer. I don't care if he's black, white, red, purple, whatever. I mean, it, it seemed ridiculous to me because, of course, 
were raised in in what we hope will become um, a pro post color society. Um, obviously, racism runs rampant and it's violent and it's terrible. I mean, that's just not changed. But uh, the idea that someone of, of color other than Caucasian, someone other than Caucasian could do something good for the country, for the state, even for your city, um, was a radical idea, you know, when my mom was born. Well, hell, when, you know, probably when I was born. I mean, 1974, I don't think we were quite adapting yet either, right? So this election, 2016, comes to sort of a, I look at it as sort of a, a boiling point, an apex, a crucible, use whatever, um, you know, that, that, you know, hot point where magnesium turns to light, whatever it is that you want to use as the metaphor, this election is there because all of the different factors that played into other elections are suddenly not playing into this one, but they played into the previous one. And so we don't know what's going to happen. And I have been watching these political ads. I don't know about you guys. And I will do a week on political ads, as you know, it's on the schedule. Um, but the, the political ads are crazy right now. And, and if you want to have some fun, just go look up the ones um, that are uh, anti Nicole Galloway. Um, they were being run by, by the way, third persons like PACs and things like that. They're not actually from the campaigns, but my God, they're scary, right? I mean, I, I, I watch them. I'm like, wow, Nicole Galloway is like evil. Um, except that I've been in the same room with her and she's shorter than I am and I don't see her as much of a threat. She's uh, She definitely is not um, coming out of the Antifa groups or whatever it is that they're claiming right now. It's, it's And yes, it has gotten that insane. We are at a point where there are no ethical standards in political campaigning and advertising. So we're going to be talking about that at some point too. So why did I just spend 22 minutes not talking about gender or sex? Because um, a lot of the things that we used to know about how gender and sex play in the field has changed. Okay. It just has. I mean, Carlin Coors Campbell is one of the premier writers on feminine style, well, she created feminine style, I'll talk about that in a second, and politics, okay? One of the first female political communication scholars, if not the first, she may have been the first. Um, I believe she's retired now. She was at the University of Minnesota as little as four years ago, uh, still as the department chair, but I'm not really sure, but she has written a ton of books. She worked, she was Kathleen uh, Hall Jamison's um, uh, director for her dissertation. So Anything that comes out of the University of Pennsylvania, Amherst uh, East, or Amherst West uh, is, is, is influenced by Carlin Coors Campbell, who started at the University of Kansas, where a lot of my advisors worked um, or were taught by her. Um, so Carlin Coors Campbell, uh, she wrote a piece a long time ago um, called Man Cannot Speak for Her, where she just put up speeches in the, I say put up as if it's on the web, right? She, she published a book, two volumes of just speeches by women, uh, most that were political in nature to show that women have been speaking in the public and that what they were saying was important for, for literally centuries. Okay. So that was the first thing. Why did we not have those before? Because women were not supposed to speak in public. So we didn't print their speeches. Okay. That just, that's just the way it was. She started changing that. And then she went through all of those and she started to realize that there were some things that women do differently than men when they speak. Um, there were five things specifically that they do when they speak. They use inclusive language, uh, the I and we. They um, use inductive reasoning. They're more likely to use narratives. Uh, they're more likely to talk about women's issues, okay? So she, she listed these things and she said, this is not just women who do this. It's the feminine style, meaning that men and women and every every part of that spectrum can utilize these uh, this style if they would like to. Um, and so don't go around thinking this is like only for women. It's not. Um, I'm going to put up an article for you describing the feminine style. I believe it's going to be from Carlin um, or it's going to be from Dow. 
um, or Perry Giles and those who have worked directly with uh, Campbell uh, on her feminine style work. Now, I happen to have think I happen to think that things have changed. Women no longer adopt a feminine style. Men adopt it more, and I do mean males here. Males adapt it more than 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 females. And the reason for that is it was played out when we had Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin running in the same election. Okay. Um, the the idea that we talked about, and I say we meaning the public discourse, we talked about Sarah Palin as sexy, the sexy soccer mom. There were pictures of her taken with shots between her legs, literally like shooting from behind her. Uh, between her legs and all you saw were her legs and the audience and looking up at her I, just disgusting things and then on the other hand Hillary Clinton was not feminine enough not sexy enough she had cankles she wore pantsuits she was this she was that she she looked like a man she was too masculine um, Sarah Palin was dumb she was too feminine you name it it came out in that election a dichotomy not of feminine speaking versus masculine or feminine style versus a masculine style, but women as speakers in the political arena differing from men as speakers. Men and women in the same contexts are not received the same way. You might say, well, that's true for everybody. We're all unique individuals. Yeah, you're a beautiful snowflake, whatever. But the point is, is that on the average, when a, a woman says something in the same position as a man who says that same exact thing, it's received differently and not necessarily, <coughs> excuse me, more positive or more negative. More often though, more negative. If you want to know about that, I'm also going to post a link uh, to one of my least favorite works, but one uh, the most recent um, work that was po uh, was published in an international journal um, with my co-authors. Uh, so it seems like maybe that makes it more credible. I don't know, uh, but it's a very it's it, it's a polemic. I, I'm not going to lie to you. It's a very um, it's not as scientific as I normally like to write. If if that's such a thing. Um, but it, it is a piece that explains this dilemma of woman as speaker rather than feminine style. And so I'm going to give you those articles and I want you to start understanding the difference between adapting a, a feminine style of language, a feminine grammar as we named it, not because it's only women, just that's what it was named by Carlin Course Campbell, um, but in, and, and how that differs from woman as speaker. So you will learn, hopefully in these readings, about the feminine style. You will learn about what's good and what's bad about it. And you will also learn about how that's changing uh, to put women, not females, not feminine speakers, but women in a double bind. And Carlin Course Campbell comes back and does in fact say that as well. Um, in fact, she has a great piece called Hating Hillary, and um, I'll go ahead and, and link that as well. I would like you to read all three of them. As a final note, I realize I'm putting this at the end of my, my little talk with you today. I can't really call it a lecture, but the end of my talk with you today, that there's only like four people who are participating online in the discussions, and no, I did not put points on them, but if, if we don't get more participation, I'm going to have to, um, because uh, I, I just assumed you all would participate in those. Um, and for those of you who have been, I greatly appreciate you. Um, you've had some really awesome thoughts. Um, but don't don't lose sight of that. Make sure you check your discussion board at least once a week. Uh, make sure that you read and make sure that you listen to these lectures. Otherwise, this class will be a waste of your time and money and we don't want that to happen, all right? So I will be, um, I think this weekend or early next week, I will be talking to you again specifically about some assignments for this class, your tests, how we're going to do those, 
uh, and um, did I if I have tests? I don't know if I have tests in there or not. And and any other projects that we're going to work on, we will talk about those in specific next week. When I also address um, some more of the issues that are coming very very quickly to us as the election is on November third. All right. Questions, comments, complaints, threats, uh, or, or otherwise aren't being heard because I'm doing one-way communication right now. <laughs> but let me know if you need anything online. Um, remember, it's best to text, call, or put something up on Blackboard. Those are the three best ways to get a hold of me. My inbox right now looks like uh, a dumpster fire. Um, so don't rely on that. And I hope you all are taking care of yourselves and being healthy. Let me know if there's anything I could do for you. Until then, read wash your hands, and I'll talk to you next week.